Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you take your seats, um, everybody's very welcome. My name is Alex White. I'm Director General of the Institute of International European Affairs. And we're really pleased to um, be hosting this event uh, this afternoon with Gas Networks Ireland. Uh, great to be working with GNI again. I know we have in the past and uh, delighted to be able to do that again this afternoon. And thanks for uh, all of the work and cooperation that your team has had with our team in preparing this event, which I've no doubt is going to be a really successful, really interesting and important one. And we're at a critical moment, um, although I think practically every time you introduce an event like this in respect of climate and, and energy decarbonisation, uh, you, you, you can fairly say that we're at a critical moment. We're always at a critical moment in this agenda, um, but it's it, there, there's so much happening. Um, I think that events, debate and discussion, the sharing of information, um, evidence-based uh, information uh, is so critical to uh, deepening uh, the public debate that we need to have. And I do admire GNI um, for, of course, not just doing their, their core work, um, which is what you're there to do, but also being willing to encourage and foster debate and discussion about many of these issues, particularly, for example, in the area of hydrogen decarbonisation um, uh, in, in, in the gas sector, and to see what can be done to contribute uh, to the big project that we have in this country and indeed in all the countries across the world uh, uh, in the broader context of uh, climate change. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, for being here. I do see at least one member of the Diplomatic Corps, but the Ambassador of New Zealand, very welcome. There may be others here. It's always a danger to, particularly in, in the context of um, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps who are kind enough to, to come to our events that I might miss one. So if you're here and I don't see you, you're also welcome. And um, But everybody's welcome. And as I know, our chair will will be uh, doing uh, will encourage you to um, to participate when the time when when the time comes. But what I'd like to do now before we hand over to our chair, Katrina Devereaux, and thank you, Katrina, for agreeing to uh, to chair this event. Katrina, as you know, is a science commentator and a broadcaster, a freelance producer. We're delighted to have her here. But before uh, Katrina takes over, I'd like delighted to introduce and to welcome Edwina uh, Nyan uh, from Gas Networks Ireland to address you briefly. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it, look, it's lovely to see some familiar faces and, and some new faces in the audience to tell us a little, to enable us to tell you a little bit more about the journey we're going on uh, to decarbonise the gas network. Um, look, we think tonight's debate is a really important one um, and we've some really interesting speakers on the panel tonight. Um, look, we see our role as decarbonising the gas network as, as pivotal to achieving net zero. And it's also really important in terms of enhancing um, and diversifying security of supply for the country. So look, all I'd like to say is we hope um, you enjoy this discussion this evening um, and you learn something new about the gas network and the journey that we're on. And I might hand over to Katrina now and without further ado to, to introduce you to the panel. So much, Edwina. Um, big round of applause, please, for Edwina and Alex. Um, so, Falter, Riv Cork, I'm delighted to welcome you all. Um, it's great to see so many in attendants. Um, and it is an important and timely discussion, the decarbonisation of Ireland's gas network. Um, as Alex said, my name is Katrina Devro. I'm a broadcaster and science communicator. And I've been telling stories about Ireland's renewable energy journey for over 20 years, which is slightly worrying. Teresa and myself were saying when we start saying over 20 years. Um, you might see me on occasion presenting Ortiz 10 Things to Know About, but um, it is a, it's a story that we've been trying to tell for a while and I and the discussions um are, are very important and needed um so I'm really honored to be guiding proceedings this afternoon um and you all know and you don't need me to tell you that you know the transition towards a low carbon future is not just an aspiration but a necessity and um the IIEA are all about sharing ideas and shaping policy so today we're really hoping for a fruitful discussion um about what it will take to build an indigenous biomethane industry and create that net zero gas network of the future and um this event has been organized with the support of GNI and um 
um, we're really pleased that we have such an esteemed panel of experts joining us um, to, to take part in these discussions. And they're all dedicated to shaping, you know, a cleaner energy future. So thank you so much for coming. Um, maybe reserve your applause for the end, otherwise you'd be worn out from cheering for them. Um, but we have Christian Forholt, from the, who's a project manager with Energinet in Denmark. Teresa O'Flynn, a partner at ARA Partners. JJ Linton, building officer at Chagas. Quiva Giblin, commercial director at Electrouge. And David Kelly, Director of Customer and Business Development at Gas Networks or Ireland. You're all very, very welcome. Big round of applause. Um, so just light housekeeping again, put your phone on silent. Um, our speakers are just going to kind of maybe give us their introductory, introductory thoughts um, for a couple of minutes and then we might, we'll go straight into the Q&A session after that. Um, for those of you in the room, you can pose your questions in the traditional raise your hand method. Um, anyone online can use the Q&A function on Zoom and, um, you know, feel free to send in your questions throughout the discussion if you're online and we'll get to them once the panelists have shared their initial thoughts. Um, and please do um, give us your name and affiliation when you're posing your question. Um, and I do really encourage you to actively participate in this conversation because, you know, we're at this kind of crucial moment of developing this strategy and this blueprint for the future. And everybody's insights and perspectives are really invaluable. So um, let's get the most out of this event. Um, if you are sharing anything on Twitter, please use the handle at IIEA. And um, all of this has been recorded. So, you know, be careful. Um, so um, our first speaker is Christian Forhold from Energinet. He is a project manager for the annual report of security of supply in the Danish gas system. He's also Energinet's associated activities country lead for projects in India, Vietnam and Poland and a project manager for your for Energinet's long-term development plan for the Danish gas and electricity systems. He has a degree in international relations and is specialized in climate diplomacy and has a lot of knowledge about how to integrate biomethane into national energy systems. So Christian, with all of that long, very worthwhile introduction, um, what are your thoughts in terms of the Danish experience and maybe how some of that can apply to the Irish experience? Right. <clears throat> so first of all, thank you so much for having me and uh, congratulations on your biomethane strategy in, uh, in Ireland. I think it's a, it's a huge step in the right direction. Um, and it's funny, when I started working with Padre, David, Karen, and all the great people from GNI a few years ago, there wasn't much, in my perspective at least, a lot of aptitude uh, towards biomethane development besides the people in GNI. So I really think uh, GNI deserves a a kudos and credit for for the development and to where you are now in Ireland um, that's that's great I hope also that that this will mean further cooperation between Denmark and, and Ireland in the, in the issues related to to biomethane whether that will be on political level or between uh, TSOs or on commercial uh, for commercial um, entities that that that's uh, you know that's that's what I hope um, so it's positive to see that the landscape is sort of changing um, and when I read the strategy, I didn't read it, read it in detail, but I saw that the the ambition was going to get to for, to uh, five point zero terawatt, terawatt hours uh, by twenty thirty, uh, which is not in, insignificant. I think it's, it's it's kind of ambitious, um, and as I mentioned, it's the right it's a good step in the right direction. Um, Ireland has a huge potential for for biomethane, probably relative to its size, one of the largest uh, throughout Europe. And in terms of, uh, there are so many similarities between Denmark and Ireland, both, um, you know, in terms of size, population area, but also, uh, but also strong agricultural history and agricultural sector in both countries. We also, uh, both of our countries seem to always lose to England in football. So uh, there's that. Not uh, in rugby, though. Not in rugby, no. Yeah, not in rugby. We don't play rugby, so. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, D Denmark, we, last year in 2023, 20, we got to 40% cons gas consumption coming from uh, from from biomethane and that's uh, you know due to a combination of factors first of all over the last 20 years um our gas consumption has declined has been declining uh, significantly but also uh, we've uh, we've seen the development of biomethane we've seen the development of more facilities being connected to the to the gas grid i think right now we're probably around uh, 60 facilities in total um, and by this year, we, we're going to get to even more because uh, 
we'll have a new subsidy scheme to be taken into place by uh, Q2, Q3, hopefully. Um, and that's really what has been driving the, this, the development in Denmark is, is the political ambition, um, having subsidy schemes and having support for, for, for both for producers, but also for uh, creating an environment where, where farmers and developers are uh, inclined and have incentives to, um, to engage in, and develop biomethane. Um, thank you, Christian. Um, we'll come to Teresa next. Teresa is a partner. Oh, sorry, it's just such a small room. We don't have very many. So Flynn is a partner at Ara Partners, a private equity firm that invests in companies that are decarbonizing the economy. She co-leads their infrastructure strategy and has more than 20 years of sustainable investing experience with extensive renewable power energy infrastructure experience, both in the fund management sector and at the operating company level. Teresa joined BlackRock in 2011 as a founding member of its global renewable power infrastructure business. And in 2019, she became global head of sustainable investing for BlackRock's alternative investment platform. And prior to joining BlackRock, Teresa worked for NTR, a private infrastructure developer across several of the group's European and US wind, wind development subsidiaries. So Teresa, you clearly have been working and watching the renewable energy sector for a while. Mm -hmm. um, what's your point, what, what's your perspective from kind of an investment point of view uh, absolutely so i my entire career up to the last few years has been dedicated to the electron um and a lot of folks here i'm sure have you know grown up in the wind energy sector here in ireland and it's you know been a booming space for many many years and ireland's wind energy professionals are working globally leading uh the wind power space but one thing to kind of note that the, the the world of industry, which is what our partners is focused on, the world of made things, it accounts for about 60% of global emissions, and it has attracted less than 10% of the climate focused capital. The big area of decarbonizing the molecule has been completely overlooked. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity for Ireland to take everything that we've done and can be incredibly proud of in relation to wind energy and now deploy that to decarbonizing the molecule. Um, it's interesting in the Gas Network's paper on biomethane, I'm just going to quote this because I think it's pretty powerful. In 2022, the Gas Network in Ireland transported twice the amount of molecules as the grid did electrons. And think about all the attention that the electron space gets. We will absolutely not get to net zero unless we tackle the world of made things, in, including molecules. So from an investment perspective, quite frankly, it's a historic investment opportunity. And the type of capital that we manage, it's typically pension funds and insurance uh, companies. And increasingly, these investors as custodians of capital for folks who want to, you know, retire with dignity or, you know, paying insurance premiums if, if, if there's a, a, an insurance claim, they need to have capital aligned with um, sustainability or climate oriented strategies, because at the end of the day, climate risk is investment risk. So you want to be exposed to the opportunity created by investing in sustainable strategies. And across financial markets, the fastest growing allocation are strategies oriented towards sustainability. So then bringing that back to the investment opportunity in Ireland, and I think some of the stats that you mentioned are, are quite uh, significant. Ireland is in pole position to be a leader when it comes to creating the new asset class of biomethane, the, 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 and one that I think will you know, completely take over from the wind sector. We still need electricity made from green energy, from wind and solar. But back to my earlier statistic, you know, the world of made things, including molecules, accounts for 60% of emissions, and it has attracted less than 10% of the climate focused capital. That absolutely is a huge mismatch and it, and it can continue. So from an our partners perspective, we are looking for investment opportunity in Ireland. We want to invest in uh, you know, developers who are developing biomethane projects. We're looking at many markets across Europe and the US as well. But I would say the opportunity here in Ireland is, is quite significant and we're highly focused on it. 
It's really interesting. It seems that we could be the world leaders in lots of things. We could be the world leaders in offshore wind. We could be the world leaders in biomethane. We just need to be doing it. Yeah. Uh, JJ, I might come to you next. Um, JJ Linehan is um, the building officer with Chagusk, and together with two of his colleagues, he looks after the technical property related issues at 55 locations of Chagusk across the country. He's an engineer by profession with a special interest in energy use. Um, and in Chagusk, where the built environment accounts for the largest proportion of energy consumed at over 80% of the total. Um, so JJ, from a, I you know you've got your own biomethane production plant um, almost up and running, um, but do you want to give us a sense of where you see, how you see Ireland building its um, biomethane infrastructure? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, just to start, natural gas is going to be an important uh, fuel uh, for heat, electricity and more recently transport going forward. Uh, and Ireland has above average use of natural gas compared to our uh, European partners. And part of that is a lot of our electricity uh, comes from natural gas. As there is increasing uh, targets for renewable fuels to be able to replace natural gas with biomethane is obviously, uh, you know, there should be a receptive audience out there. Uh, Chagas research over the last few years has uh, shown the potential to produce suitable feedstocks for the industry. And the research was started by Parik O'Kiley, who was the principal uh, silage uh, researcher in Chagas. And he was looking at alternative uses for grass. Uh, the country can pr produce more grass than we need at the moment. And there's obviously what was restrictions on uh, herd size with uh, with quotas. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the potential um, uh, outlets for grass was as an AD feedstock. And uh, SEI, SEI reports have have since uh, confirmed uh, that potential. Animal slurries are an attractive component of the resource mix, but forage crops are really the standout uh, opportunity. And forage crops, the 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 the, the typical forage crop or, or main uh, forage crop would be perennial ryegrass. But uh, more recently, uh, red clover had been forgotten about in the country when cheap nitrogen uh, became available. But red clover as a legume that can fix nitrogen, we see as, 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 as a very important resource uh, to produce forages uh, for AD. You have to conform to a renewable energy directive and um, you know, producing forages without nitrogen is, 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 is part of, of, of the answer. We're predominantly grassland in, in Ireland, 90%, which is not typical in Europe. Uh, why? It rains throughout the year. We have mild winters and we, it never gets too hot in the summer. Um, so we can produce good, good uh, quantities of grass. But while on a dairy farm, you will be producing 10 tonnes per hectare of dry matter because there's an incentive to have, you know, to produce milk from the cow. The typical dry matter output is six tons per hectare, and you know, on sheep and uh, cattle farms, that's probably uh, the average uh, production. At Grange, uh, we're producing twelve tons of dry matter per hectare from red clover, so you can see the potential there to produce uh, more forages, uh, and uh, I call that the, the 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 opportunity of the hidden hectares. Uh, the target of 5.7 terawatt hours uh, from 2030 is, is, is ambitious, uh, but the feedstock is potentially there. If we were to dedicate land fully to produce the feedstock, you're talking about 120,000 hectares. And this equates to only 3% of agricultural land. And if you look at producing some of that on the hidden hectares, you don't have to take all, you know, you don't even have to go to, to 3% to produce the 5.7 terawatt hour uh, uh, target. Of course, you'll be using manures and other wastes to, to complement that. Uh, what is also interesting, if the country has to ultimately reduce ruminant numbers to reach the targets, it's a fairly easy change for farmers to produce the crop, the feedstocks, the, the type of crop that they're used to producing just to go to the, another market. But it is important that it's economically, you know, uh, uh, suitable or, or economically attractive because farmers react obviously to 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 that stimulus. We had a grass drying industry in the country, which we we uh, had a very substantial grass drying industry based on large units, four hundred hectares of grassland, and uh, the output was a protein feed supplement for pigs and poultry. Uh, that. Uh, 
uh, industry ultimately fell by the wayside because soybean meal came of, came available from the US and South America. And f oil was the fuel used in Ireland to dry the grass. And in the 70s, that, you know, the economics just uh, 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 went south, if you like. Um, but the experience would show that uh, for 25 years, grass was assembled at scale on, on you know, in the, in, across the country. Th those were dotted around the country. So I have no doubt, but if 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 the price is right, farmers will will stand up to the to the mark and produce the the material. Uh, just another interesting, just going back a little bit further in history, uh, we we talk about one hundred and twenty thousand hectares needed uh, to produce the the forages. If that was dedicated land that we weren't looking at trying to produce more on existing land. In 1850, there were 600,000 hectares of oats grown in the country, and we had 600,000 horses. Um, so, you know, they were providing the motive power of the day. So you had land dedicated, 600,000 hectares dedicated to, uh, to, to energy. We only have 20,000 hectares of oats uh, today in the country. And if we, if we just take a, a situation where maybe 25% of the forages can, would come from hidden hectares, in other words, boosting the output on existing grassland, um, we're only looking at uh, targeting 15% of the land base that was dedicated to energy production in 1850. And we'd actually producing about one and a half times the energy as biomethane that we, that we were in 1850. Um, at the moment, production processes of enterprise are encouraged to operate on a, on a circular economy basis. And AD is an ideal example of implementing that approach. Animal waste are treated by the process to reduce emissions of methane and to provide energy. In a biofinery approach, products like protein can be extracted uh, from forages before the material is used as, uh, as an AD feedstock. And biogenic CO2 can be harvested as part of the, the biogas to biomethane upgrading process. And finally, they digest it as a biofertilizer. And all those, you know, all those uh, um, products would be very important to, uh, to, to try to make it, uh, to try to get the economics right, because that's always going to be a challenge. Gas will be, you know, natural gas will be cheaper. And unless there's, you know, a stimulus put in there because of the carbon benefits of biomethane or the other, uh, the other products that, uh, that the other coal products that are in the system, uh, they'll, they'll all be important to make the economics correct. JJ, that's really interesting. I like this idea of kind of looking back to look forward and also in terms of security of supply and all those kind of things as well. But we'll dig into all of that later. Um, Quiva, I might come to you now. Um, Quiva Giblin is a member of Electra Roots uh, Senior Management Team and leads their commercial origination and trading operations team. Um, she's worked in the energy sector for over 15 years and sits on the Council of Wind Energy Ireland. She was formerly Director of Finance at SSE Renewables, where she had responsibility for the financial activities of SSE's extensive on and off offshore wind development and construction portfolio. She's a qualified chartered accountant with a degree and master's in accountancy and spent six years working with KPMG in Dublin and New Zealand. Um, so Guiva, do you want to tell us a little bit about the work that's kind of happening right now kind of thing? First, thanks very much, Katrina. Lovely to, to be here today. Um, as Katrina mentioned, I work for a company called Electro Route. We're an energy trading company based here in Dublin. We have a very, a very much focus on the renewable sector, providing a variety of different trading services to renewable energy assets, whether that's on the power side or the gas side. And some of our clients come from kind of asset owners who own renewable projects and are looking for offtake solutions and risk management solutions for their projects. And other clients we have are on the corporate side who are looking to procure clean, green energy to decarbonize their own energy consumption. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the company. It was founded 13 years ago here in Dublin, and um, a, lot of the, a lot of the founders worked in the utility space, and they saw the opportunity to create a utility-style trading function to focus on the, 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 the growing uh, need for that type of service in the renewable sector. The company was originally you know, Irish owned and about five years ago, Mitsubishi Corporation invested in the company. So we're a subsidiary now of Mitsubishi Com Corporation. We trade across about 15 different markets here in Europe and we have a growing business as well in Japan. Our purpose as a company is to make net zero a reality. And you know, for, for us, we're really passionate about the, the drive to uh, decarbonize the, the, the Irish uh, economy as well as um, kind of all, all we can do around all the different markets we operate in. 
I laughed when, when you said I was over 15 years. I think I need to update my biography because unfortunately it's <laughs> at least 20 now. And like you were saying, yeah, over 20 years in the renewable space. And like Teresa, my focus initially was on the wind side. Like Teresa, I worked in electricity from the early 2000s when, the comp when that company um, was really kind of pushing the boundaries about what was achievable in, in the wind sector here in Ireland. A little bit like the biomethane industry, the, you know, the industry was a very immature like by me, then there was only a handful of actual real projects um, and active in the market. And there was you know, really ambitious um, people in the sector, but a huge amount to do to get to the point we're at today. But it was done, you know, the pioneers in the sector really pushed and mobilized to deliver what we've seen on the wind sector. You know, you're to date, I think it's about 36% of the power demand in the country has been has been satisfied by renewables. So, you know, there's every reason the same can be done on the on the green gas and the renewable gas side. Um, kind of on reflection, I guess it was, there's some big differences between the wind sector 20 years ago and the biomethane sector today. I think, firstly, we've seen what other countries can do. You know, it's really impressive to hear what Christian said about the Danish experience, how they've managed to achieve 40 percent green gas in their network. And the other big difference is the targets that have been set by government. Yeah, the government has set yeah, really, really ambitious targets, the 5.7 terawatt hours that's been mentioned. And I think, you know, in the for the rest of this decade, that acts as a effectively a North Star for the policymakers, for the asset owners and investors like Teresa and our partners, for the lenders, the funders, for companies like us as service providers and traders. You know, it provides that, I guess, catalyst for, for mobilizing to really deliver and drive this sector, this industry. I thought it might be useful just to touch on a interesting transaction in the space we worked on last year at Electroroute. We worked with a large international transport company who was looking at how to decarbonize their road transport activities here in the Irish market. They had invested in a number of um, renewable fuel haulage trucks and they came to us. So, you know, in the medium term, they'd love to be able to procure and they intend to procure indigenous Irish by methane. But that supply wasn't there today. So we worked with them on an innovative solution to import green gas from continental Europe across a number of different national borders and bring it into the Irish market in order to fuel their, their trucks. We worked very closely with the, with the GNI team and regulatory authorities across all the different um, regions of this gas transported. And, you know, I guess for us, that's not the long term goal for us. Why we were really excited about this transaction was that it demonstrated a real demand on the island of Ireland for, for green gas. And it shows that you know, with, with, with the right conditions, we can deliver um, that green gas because it is needed. There is that demand here. Um, I guess, you know, the, the policy, the, the targets of 5.7 terawatt hours, they're, you know, it's very ambitious. We're halfway through the, the decade already and we still haven't seen the, um, the obligation details. There's no clarity on exactly what, what structures we put in place by the state to support and encourage this investment. I think corporates will have a big part to play. And we're seeing companies like this transport company and other big energy users like data centers, pharmaceutical companies looking for uh, looking for sources of green gas. So you know, I think that demand is there, but really it needs a lot more joined up thinking by all the policymakers to really, really get the, the economy and um, the biomethane economy going. Thanks so much, Kiva. Joined up thinking. I think we, they need to teach that in school or something. We need a bit more of that. Um, David, we'll come to you um, last, but by no means least. Um, David Kelly is the Director of Customer and Business Development at GNI. Um, he, David has over 20 years of executive level experience in both the private and public sectors. And prior to his current role, he was the Group Head of Customer Operations and Public Affairs for Ervia. Um, David, do you want to kind of come in about what GNI has been working on um, since after hearing everybody else's reflections? Yeah, I look Look, just to say really thank you to everybody that's here in person but also to those of you that are connecting virtually uh, you're very welcome as well um i'll be brief um just very just two things i want to say if i can um firstly about the role of gas today and, and you alluded to it earlier Teresa. uh like gas is really critical to ireland's economy today um, and that's going to continue in, into the medium and long term um to put it in context there's an awful lot of noise about gas and domestic use 65% of the gas we use today in the Republic is used in power generation. Um, 
just under 30% of the gas we use today is in commercial enterprise. So, so there's a very small percentage used in domestic use, but it's still 40% of heating. So it's, it's a really, really important vector today. And right now we're largely 80% dependent on the UK uh, for, for that gas, for that commodity. So we have a problem. And the field, the indigenous gas field, Corrib, has probably less than 10 years of, of, of life expectancy, um, if you can use that term with a, a gas field in mind. So having a source of indigenous secure gas, that's this side of the pond is really important for us. So biomethane is, 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 is potentially a very, very good replacement for any other indigenous gas that, that may fall off in time. Um, as Christian said, we've been looking at this for a number of years. Um, uh, and what is heartening to see, frankly, is the level of interest and demand from the market despite the policy. And what I mean by that is, and I'm not in any way trying to, to, to uh, cast shade on our policymakers, but it's been a long time coming. Um, so what's happening now and what we're seeing now around biomethane is that entities are getting ahead of the policy. They're engaging, they're contracting, they're building. There's big foreign investment coming into the market now. Um, and it's almost despite the fact that we're still debating and discussing where the biomethane should be used, which is good and it's not good. Um, so what, what I'll say is that G and I uh, were very keen to see the advent of a, a really buoyant renewable gas sector in Ireland, frankly, because it's our vision and purpose to convert what we do today, which is transport natural gas to renewable and ideally zero carbon gases. We've done that before, by the way. So, so you may not be aware, but, but GNI is 50 years old actually next year. And we transported town gas right up into the mid eighties, um, gas derived from coal. And there was a huge conversion program that took place in the eighties. A lot of the guys and girls that were involved in that, by the way, are still in the company, which is interesting. Um, but we need to now convert from natural gas to biomethane and ultimately hydrogen. And that's something that's really, really important to our company. So I'll leave it at that and for the- Well, do you want to follow up with that and tell us what do you think are the main obstacles to that? What, what are the big hurdles that you see ahead of you? Well, for biomethane, there are no obstacles. There are no hurdles today to inject it. And we're injecting tiny amounts today. Uh, we injected 70 gigawatts of, of biomethane into the grid last year, uh, which, you know, in the context of 57 terawatts, it's, it's very, very small. So, so, you know, is there any reason why we couldn't get to 5.7 terawatts by 2030 with what's in place today? No, there isn't actually. Uh, and if I look at the, the four entities that have contracted now to connect AD plants directly into the grid, and, and they're under construction right now, they're getting ahead. They're, they're moving on. There's players, and I'll, I'll call out one. I don't mean to plug anybody, but I'll call out one who was in the media last week, Neffin Energy. Uh, they've established Neffin Renewable Gas. It's, it's headquartered in TIP. Uh, it was opened by the Minister for Enterprise, Simon Coveney, last week. Uh, they're building 30 plants. They have six going into planning this month. Um, that is Canadian pension fund investment. It's half a billion euro investment in a sector that doesn't exist really in Ireland today of note. So that's really heartening. And that's why I'm optimistic when you see players like that. And there's others. There's lots of other players that are, that are experienced in other jurisdictions starting to invest in the country. We want to support them. We want to work with them. And then ultimately, we want to try and bring the farming community and the agriculture community and the waste community along with us, because we're all, I guess, learning on the job to somewhat. And we're learning from the likes of Christian and, and what, what uh, Den Denmark are the rock stars in this sector. What they've achieved in the last 10 years is frankly remarkable. And every time you read it, it was like 30%, 34%, 40% today. I was like, would you just slow down so we can catch up with you? Um, does anybody want to come back on anything that you've heard from uh, the other speakers there? I have a good few questions, but you might want to reflect on some. I think it's interesting what both uh, JJ and uh, David said in terms of security of supply, because uh, we, we face sort of the same issue in Denmark with uh, only having uh, two entry points, basically, for, for our gas and, you know, consumption. And that's really where biogas or biomethane plays a huge role because more entry points means better security of supply. So, I know because you kind of weep here in Quiva saying you have to ship um, biogas from Europe and all the hoops you have to jump through to do that when you know we have potential here, here on the ground. Absolutely, and you know it's clear there is that potential from the statistics that JJ shared, and you know it's untapped at the moment, and and I think a big push. You know, is needed across across the industry from everyone in this room 
the policymakers to make that happen. It, just a comment I would make because there's been a lot of you know comparison to you know everybody there's a lot of people very proud about you know the, the wind energy heritage here in Ireland and, and genuinely punching above our weight on a global scale and then as a result the opportunity uh, for our Irish uh, biomethane I, I would say from an investment perspective the technology itself is proven AD proven it is proven but the actual you know operations of the plants themselves, they are more complex to your wind energy project. Wind energy and solar energy resources fee is free. Here, feedstock is absolutely critical. How you, you know, procure that feedstock is absolutely essential and the security around that. And I think there's a lot of lessons learned that we can take uh, from, from Denmark in that regard. I heard someone describe biomethane as a mechanical cow, and I think it's a really good way to think about it. You have to be really careful about the feedstock composition and what goes into your mechanical cow, because it can really vary and impact your gas yield. So the variables in a biomethane investment uh, project, it, mo many more variables than what we had traditionally in your wind and solar space. That's not a bad thing necessarily. I think what is really important though is you know making sure that you're working with experienced partners who've been through that journey before because at the end of the day, you know ultimately the investors are looking for solid returns. They want to see contracted cash flows. Uh, what you're basically seeing is the corporates, um, some of the folks that Electroroot have worked with, they're in the absence of fixed feed and tariffs and you know et cetera, et cetera. They're procuring the gas directly on long-term contracts because they see it as existential to their business model, as in we need to have a secure source of gas and it needs to be green because if not, um, you know, what's the alternative? There may be carbon penalties, et cetera. So there's a lot more variables. And I think as Ireland develops its, its biomethane industry with a huge advantage given our feedstock position, just making sure that we think through that, working with experienced partners to accelerate and not learn the lessons that others have learned 10 or so years ago I think mm. is certainly a, a comment that I would make yeah I know so instead of bemoaning the fact that we're late to the party let's just learn from all the mistakes that let's let's before. catch up and run fast because we have a huge advantage here um well actually a question that kind of t is around the economics of the biomethane um it's from John Fitzgerald co-chair of the IEA Eco economists um for example, how much would it cost in terms of tons of carbon dioxide avoided and how much carbon dioxide would it displace if the target was reached by 2030? Does anyone have those numbers to their top of their head? Yeah, John Fitzgerald had to ask that, didn't he? It's specific um, about the tons. Yeah, we'll have to revert to him with the specifics on it because it varies. It depends on where the, the source of the the uh, the feedstock is, is coming from will determine the, the level of carbon offset that there is. Um, so yeah, that's probably the best way to describe that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare give a give a firm answer to an economist on that. And is that part of the kind of hesitancy? Is just those kind of unintended consequences, or you know, um, use land use or resources not being used in the in the most efficient manner? You know that we don't do it efficiently, actually. Well, I guess it triggered a comment in my mind, which is I think you know you know, hats off to Gas Network Ireland in this regard, because they're connected into Denmark, they're bringing folks to Germany, there's a real desire, I can certainly see it from a, a GNI perspective to make sure that as this industry gets off the ground, it's connected into the folks who are ahead so that we can learn as much as possible. I think in relation to some of those comments that you made, data and collecting it is really important. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we were visiting a uh, a biogas site in Belgium and you open they have the fridge and they have like the samples of all of the various different feedstock that come in on this date they need to keep, keep it for six months so that they actually can verify where it came from what it is because actually all of that data on the ingredients really determine the price that you're going to get paid at the end of the day and um, because if it's biomethane from manure relative to biomethane from food waste the price that someone's going to pay for that is actually going to be different so there's a huge amount of you know uh need for proper process and procedure around tracking every ingredient that goes into that mechanical cow um, we have another question from David Maxwell, um, future biogas. Uh, Ireland has a lot of promise for biomethane from grasses. Do you think this could be combined with carbon capture to create net negative gas? JJ, that might be for you, is it? 
Um, yeah, I mean, carbon capture, it's not an area that I'm, uh, you know, I have uh, much uh, knowledge on, but uh, there's obviously technologies there. But the, the, the real issue with uh, grass is that if, if the forages, and I mentioned red clover, if you're producing the forages without any artificial nitrogen, basically, you know, you're, you're in carbon neutral uh, territory. And actually, as long as we're purchasing um, conventional fertilizer, as long as the, the Ireland, we don't have any manufacturing facilities anymore, uh, but as long as we're importing conventional fertilizer, the ability to use the, the uh, digested as a biofertilizer replacement, again, has uh, uh, positive uh, uh, benefits to the, to the overall, uh, overall carbon balance. Um, I might open it to the people in the room. Do you have a question? Do will you um, stand up and give us um, in your best voice, please, because we don't have a roving mic. No, we don't have a roving mic. Just and I'll I'll relay it down to the back of the room. Well, thank you very much. So I'm I'm of Mike like tomorrow, and I co-chair the Climate Energy Group here at the Institute. And my day job, I work in the Navy Investment Bank. And uh, my question is really around the sector and whether, it, whether it, and if and when it will take off. Because we've got the finance question, we've got the feedstock question, the offtake, the gas transportation system, and of course the policy question. And we, uh, Repower EU has uh, 35 BCM target, which is 10, a factor of 10 times. We've got the 5.7 target here, which translates to something like 150 to 200 plants. And notwithstanding the welcome announcements from left and there, I'm just wondering are all the ingredients, technology, feedstock, offtake, gas, and policy ready for this uh, sector to take off in Ireland? Thank you very much. So, just before you say that, just for anyone um, listening at home on their computer, yeah, what is what does it take for it to take off? Of all, if all the different factors are in place, what is going to be the catalyst? I don't want to say that lights the fire because that sounds terrible when it comes to gas, but what's going to um, what's going to kick this off in a big way? I can kick it off. Excuse the um, awful, awful segue there. But, uh, yeah, on fire and all that. Uh, for, like in short, 5.7 terawatts we feel is very achievable. I, I'm going to say that now. Uh, we published, uh, Paul Rick and the team published a biomethane energy report in September last year. Uh, I think you probably got a copy um, that we went to the market. It was a pretty blunt instrument. We asked anybody that was ever interested in building a plant are you still interested in building a plant? Where are you with planning? What's your feedstock? What scale of plant? And roughly where is it going to be? And we got a massive response. As you as you know, we, we had a response from nearly 200 uh, projects uh, all over the country, bar one county. Uh, I won't call out the county for fear that the, I'll, I'll get a backlash. But nonetheless, it was very national. Um, and take it that it was a blunt instrument. Take it that it's people saying, this is what we hope to do not what we will do uh it came to 14.8 terawatt so so that's a blunt instrument i'll say it for the third time um but ultimately what we're seeing is a level of of traction and appetite that 5.7 we think is very achievable assuming that you have your funding which is a big if but certainly the early movers are largely equity funded we find um they're not looking for project finance we find but Certainly, it does need a real level of certainty from government. And what was perhaps a little disappointing about strategy when it was published, and if you read the, the excellent uh, article from Stephen Robb in today's Farmer's Journal, he gives a really good overview of, of key feedback from key audiences. There's a general disappointment okay. that why didn't the government provide more certainty for investors and developers? Uh, like Christian's government did in 2012, uh, like they're doing again this year with, yeah. with subsidy support. So my sense is absolutely is an appetite. Yes, there's funding to get us going on this big, big time. But what we really need is signals from policy. Uh, and I think that that's welcome and it's coming, I think, is my sense. Any other questions from the room? Yes, Porig. There's one for uh, JJ. I told JJ, look, it's a very in energy intensive. Sorry, Podrick, will you just say who you are for other people? I mean, Gas Network Ireland. It's a very energy intensive room here as well in terms of the participants. But maybe to give some of us who wouldn't have a full understanding of the agricultural implications, what does it mean in reality for the, the feedstock provider, the farmers? Like, what are they going to have to invest in and what are they, how are they, and how quickly can they adapt? 
to providing feedstock over quite a long time. Well, well, just um sorry, Jay, I'm sorry for pausing now, but just in case anyone didn't hear on Zoom, that's just what what is in it for farmers and how is it going to work for them? Okay, well, just we talked about feedstock supply there as part of our um uh, research. We did an expression, simple expression of interest a couple of years ago in, a, in the local paper. We need about sixty hectares to uh, provide the forages for the for the plant, and uh, we were looking for it within ten kilometres of Grange because obviously you know transport of uh, materials are, uh, you know, ten kilometres is is okay, but you don't want to be going fifty kilometres. But we're over oversubscribed by a factor of twelve in terms of the area to be provided. So that would reflect on, you know, the research to show the potential resource resource that's there. In terms of uh, what farmers would have to do, it depends on the big plants will probably have the storage at, at, at the plants. So the forages would be produced and transported. Uh, you would have situations maybe whereby also the, the, the slurry would be provided at the plant. I think it'll be different you know, there'll probably be different um, uh, designs or different approaches. But in terms of the feedstock, you're producing the same crop as you're producing at the moment. So the machinery, the knowledge, you know, all that is already there. In the past, we looked at things like miscanthus, you know, a new crop. Uh, how do you handle it? How do you harvest it? N nothing was in place. And uh, that didn't turn out, you know, as a, you know that, that overall project or overall result for that you know, it wasn't great. But um, uh, uh, I have, uh, I'm fairly confident that, you know, farmers will step up to the mark. Contractors, they have, you know, this, it's the same type of equipment. So, you know, it's it's already, in, in, in you know, ingrained in, 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 in the industry. Can I ask, um, what's the experience of Danish farmers when it comes to AD? Uh, I'm probably not the best one to answer okay. that question. Um, are they happy? <laughs> they are happy, yeah. But it, it's, uh, I think, the agricultural sector in Denmark is a little bit different in, than it is in in in, uh, in, uh, in Ireland. But as I mentioned, when uh, when we when the uh, when the subsidy scheme started back in in twenty twelve, uh, there was an uh, there was there was incentives for the farmers to to really get this going. So it played a huge uh, huge role. So I mean. I haven't asked them lately, but I'm pretty sure they're happy. Okay. And in the absence of those kind of supports here, it's kind of slowing progress. Is that what you're saying, David? Yeah, I, th I think what, what, what we are seeing, though, is um, some of the developers that are getting ahead of policy are, are signing 15-year feedstock deals with farmers now uh, and with co-ops now. Um, so, so you know, that th there was a, a really decent income stream available for farmers today. Um, they obviously get then, as, as JJ mentioned, but the 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 gesture uh, by by way of um, the circular uh, response. But there's other things that that we would love them to consider, which is potentially getting involved directly, becoming AD developers directly, uh, and that's what I think the strategy is looking to to address as well. So so there's a real ownership within the agriculture community for this. So a co-op kind of absolutely going and, back and it's, to our co -op. it's starting to emerge in, in pockets around the country, but it's it's been slow. Um there's a lot of other things on their minds. But it sounds like that's not kind of the area that you're thinking. You're thinking bigger than that, are you? No, no, and actually I, I should have mentioned our partners, we 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 already have um a biomethane business that's active in Ireland, cycle zero. Um and you know it's certainly looking at um, you know, the smaller kind of farm skid mounted, uh, you know, uh, technology. So it's a very cost effective way to unlock the, the smaller farms and signing up um, with farmers 15 year agreements for feedstock. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a farmer's daughter from the west of Ireland, so I have a, a, a perspective on how farmers think. Um, and, you know, there's a huge education that's required here. I mean, there's been some stuff in the, the press, I'm sure we've all seen it, where, you know, people can react to something that's new and there's a huge education required because the opportunity for someone to have an income stream mm -hmm. from, you know, agricultural waste, if you, if that is explained to a farmer in the right way, mm -hmm. they're all very commercially minded. And I think right. it's, it's, you know, down through the years in Creva, you've seen it as well. You know, the farmers that had, wind turbines on their land they're set up for life they have a steady income coming in annually for 
the next 25, 30 years. The same opportunity um, exists here as it relates to bringing the farming community along. Um, so I, I think it's it's it, it, it's a win-win situation if it's done the right way. Any other questions in the room? Yes. Uh, Brian Kennedy, uh, you lead the plant origination business for Alak Foods. Uh, so I work quite closely with people on the development of uh, our strategy around this area. Um, quite a question just really around the policy, uh, government policy, particularly around data centers and large energy users. I, I would characterize that as confused and conflicted at best. Um, and what I'm wondering though is, on one hand, David, you're saying that you know you're, you're seeing some, some movement in that. 2030 is tomorrow in energy terms and in infrastructure terms. First question is, do you see government policy catching up quick enough? Because ultimately, I think it's fair to say data centers are seen as the stimulus, uh, and, and maybe large farm businesses as the stimulus for this economy um, yeah, over the next maybe three to five years. Maybe just a follow-up question to you, is it, like, what's the what's the business plan when you go in and you're and you're, and you're spending you know, all the money you have on on on, on planning and, and securing feedstock? Is it in the hope uh, and expectation that government policy will catch up with an incentive scheme? Uh, or indeed is, is data centers and farming businesses the, the, the way forward for the medium term. So um, um, is policy going to move fast enough and what's the business plan? Okay, a uh, nice easy one. Um, the data center debate is very controversial. Uh, you know that it's it's been played out in the media. On one hand, uh, the economy, this economy is built, a lot of it on the tech sector. Um, those big investors have publicly said they want their data beside their people. Um, they're big investors and they invest all over the world. So that's one perspective. On the other hand, we have a serious emissions problem to sort. Uh, so there's, that's the dilemma. And the same is happening, by the way, with regard to the airport expansion, which is also playing out at the moment as well. Um, both very controversial, both a real challenge because there isn't an easy solution. Um, if, if, if I was to say there's going to be an easy, quick solution to it, I'd be lying to you. We've been engaged in those discussions for getting on for 20 months. Um, we're, we're a very small player in a very rich debate. Um, but there's one thing for sure, and it's not, I, I don't want to single out data centers. Um, gas users, high energy users, large energy users, uh, we're, we're very focused, by the way, on our top 300 large energy user community. These aren't data centers in fact, they're not at all. They're actually large, high heat industries, drying businesses, food businesses, pharmaceutical businesses, all big job creators around the country. They're desperately looking to decarbonize their, their, their businesses and they can't electrify. So, so we see that sector. Of course, the data centers are, are part of that, if you like, large energy user base. But that existing customer base is, is a really key focus for us. And we're engaging with them directly about the art of the possible on renewable gas. So I'm not I'm not uh, saying there's an so easy fix. Do you fix think solution. policy needs to support those industries first? And then, you know, you can stick a solar panel on your data centre. So if you do that way. If I was a politician, Katrina, which I'm absolutely not, never will be, uh, jobs are really important for every economy. Uh, I personally like the idea that Ireland is putting its best foot forward to create as many jobs for this economy. I hate the idea of work that we can do exceptionally well going to other jurisdictions because we're dithering. That's my sense of it. Um, so I do believe we should be looking after the existing customers. And I, I spend most of my time looking after our 725,000 customers today. It's, it's the biggest part of my job today. But I'm really conscious of those high heat users that would and that are looking to decarbonize and just can't with the vectors available to them on electrification. And Teresa, do you want to come in with your business plan? So at the end of the day, it's all about the revenue line, right? And that's where I think government policy can just accelerate. Yes, there are corporates in a probably fragmented way signing up today, right? Um, but it's, you know, unless there's a real strong signal from government, we're, we're definitely not going to get there on time. So for you to invest capital, and, and some people are willing to take the development risk. Some people want to come in when it's shovel ready, classic infrastructure investors like you know the part of the business i represent ideally you're coming in when your planning is secured and you kind of know what the roadmap looks like including that route to market but people will be able to and be willing to spend 
money uh, uh, earlier stage in the development process if it's very clear who your customer is going to be and you have a good sense of what they're going to pay. But if it's like, will it will it be will it be data center over here or will it be you know road haulier over here? Like that just creates just you know lack of you know to a lot of barriers to to kind of moving fast. So I guess you know your earlier comment, it's yeah, what's what's the revenue line? And if you're clear on that. Well, you know, I think I think there would be a massive pivot in terms of how quickly we're um, approaching this agenda. Um, another question has come here in from Naomi Bloomline from the Institute of Public Administration, who's curious if there are any observations or tips um, from the Danish experience on overcoming vested interests and lobbying from the fossil fuel industry. Sure. I mean, um, I think it's kind of similar to the wind adventure in Denmark, uh, you know, years back in. Um, there's always going to be doubters and there's always going to be people trying to push a different agenda. But in Denmark, like Ireland, there's an, an optimism and a, a can-do attitude towards, uh, towards uh, uh, the green transition. So I think that's that's probably pushing the agenda even more than, than, um, than this. And I think it's about everybody, politicians, uh, TSO investors, uh, farmers, and so on. Um, you know, cooperating in uh, in whatever capacity they can. Um, yeah. So keep on keeping on kind of thing. Probably, yeah. Yeah, I think, and I'm, what we're doing today is great. And I think what, you know, as I talked about the, previously, the work GNI has done is uh, it's really, in my perspective, uh, pushing the agenda in a good way. I mean, it's kind of hard to argue with a no-brainer in a way when it's ticking so many boxes. It's just, I suppose, it's it's what are the next steps forward. Um, another question for Denmark. Sorry, now you're getting, you have to go deep into stuff about energy crops. Um, right. This is from Shane Doherty, um, who says that Denmark is phasing out the use of energy crops for biomethane production. Um, why is this? And should Ireland continue to follow a grass-based feedstock supply? Um, I mean, I wouldn't... Uh touch upon what you should do in Ireland and what shouldn't do. Um, but yeah, we're facing it out in Denmark. I think I think right now it's probably around 10% or something like that. In the future, the, the, the limit will be five or six or seven percent, something like that. Um, and and in Denmark the, the predominant biomass is uh, is manure and it will be in the future, even though there's other stuff such as food waste and, and municipal waste that so will Play, play a part as well. And is that some of the hesitancy in Ireland is just this kind of idea of um, like food security and um, land use, you know, we have, we have huge commitments in terms of rewilding and, you know, changing our agricultural practices and locking ourselves into still growing grass is something that we're actually trying to move away from or not? Well, uh, look, at I think the, the actual quantities, you know, the land area needed for the, in the Irish context are relatively small. And uh, we have a lot of land uh, producing approximately half of what it could produce. So if that was really managed correctly, I don't think you would you would have very little impact on um, things like biodiversity uh, and you could produce it sustainably. And red clover is definitely left definitely the crop. Just in Denmark, I've, I, 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 am I right in saying that the animals tend to be in all year round and you use a lot of straw, you have a lot of tillage, so you use, use a lot of straw for bedding, so you have a lot of manure uh, we tend to have animals in for relatively short periods uh, and we have slurry systems. So um, slightly different uh, 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 potential feedstock availability. But um, Ireland is predominantly grassland. So I think, you know, when you look at the actual quant uh, the, the percentage of the land area that we're looking at, it's, it's relatively small, relatively small. Would you like to go ahead? Uh, Brian Daly is my name. I'm the board of the Institute. Um, first of all, well done all the speakers. It was fantastic. Um, my question is difficult. I'm not an expert on the topic, um, but from an overall policy point of view in Ireland, uh, being interested in uh, the panels or anybody on the panel's view on the interaction between the policy with respect to gas and biomethane and the policy with respect to electrification. So I hear a lot about everything is electrification, heat pumps, that's what deployment of health. Resources because I have to have to deal with heating the houses, uh, etc. David may have alluded to some of this earlier comment about how biomethane might be best deployed. But is there, a, from your perspective, of the right policy framework in place balance the agenda between the electrification side and the gas? Sorry. So the to paraphrase, what's how do we reconcile putting a plug on everything with the fact that you can't put a plug on everything? Uh, 
Yeah, so how do we reconcile those? Who'd like to take that? I can have a go, uh, if you like, Brian. Um, firstly, there isn't an either or. Um, there's no doubt about it. The electrification, uh, I'm going to say lobby, just the electrification lobby has been in situ for a number of decades and I've made a lot of sense and I've made a lot of progress. Um, for us to get to net zero, it needs every technology to be considered and it needs to be seen that there's benefits for renewable wind, solar. We need backup for when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, that's renewable. Uh, and we need a very urgent phase out of fossil. Um, and there's lots of solutions to achieve all of that. Um, and I think the more we debate about one is better than the other, the less we'll achieve our targets, is my read of it. Um, and I think it's improving, by the way. So what we're talking about here is an integrated energy system. And there's more integration now than there was even two years ago in terms of debate, discourse, discussion. I see Jag in the, in the room here from ESB. We are working very well together now um, because we have to coexist and and. You know, what I said earlier about that 65% of Ireland's gas is used in power generation, and that will continue to grow because electricity is going to continue to grow. Uh, I think that that wasn't understood, frankly, that even just that message, how important electricity is. But in the total energy mix, oil is still the dominant vector in Ireland today. Mm -hmm. still 50% of primary energy in Ireland. Like gas is only 30% of Ireland's total energy. So all of that debate in the round, integrated energy system needing to evolve, I think there's a much more mature debate taking place now and there's less of the finger pointing going on and, you know, this is good and this isn't so good, in my sense. Less of the either or and more, we need, it, we need everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an, another stat, um, but it's from Germany. So 85% of the power in the German market is molecules. So it's like like the, the the molecule does not get enough of attention and we, we need to have green molecules in order to achieve our, our net zero targets. You, you can't electrify everything. The production of chemicals, the production of materials, like decarbonizing the world of made things. You look around the room, the electron has gotten all the attention. There is so much more carbon embedded in our daily lives, materials, chemicals, what heats this room, et cetera. We talked about gas. I think it's just simply been overlooked, perhaps because the policy signals on the electrification side were much clearer and they have been for decades. Um, also, I think just the world of industry tends to be inherently fragmented. So the investment opportunity is is kind of, you know, it's, it's you know, a lot of investors, they want to gravitate towards the big, large transactions because a lot of infra funds now are, you know, 15, 20 billion dollars. Um, we're actually very much focused on the mid market where you're looking for smaller investment opportunities. So I, I kind of feel there's been a, a reason why it has been the way it is, but it's, it is definitely changing because I think people have switched on to the need to sort of broaden it outside of, of electrification. Do you see that, Quiva? Do you see that kind of, um, it, it's been less about putting a plug on everything and about actually um, decarbonizing all our energy? Absolutely. It's going to be a blend. And, you know, we also have hydrogen on the horizon as well which, you know, as, as that technology develops and becomes commercialized, that'll also bring a different dimension. But it's not going to be possible to electrify everything, but it is a really key component of the decarbonization journey. But there's simply some processes that can't be electrified that are going to require longer term um, solutions around green gas. And do you think there's a prioritization that's going to happen with that, like where those things are going to be just top of the list, knock them off, take, get rid of your 5%, 10%, that kind of thing? Yeah, no, there is. And um, in fact, there's a... I can't remember his name off the top of my head, um, but there, there is a hydrogen ladder has been published. Michael Liebert. Liebert. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. this, uh, this, this question is coming from Michael Coyle, who's an IEA member, saying, will hydrogen achieve a role anytime soon in the GNI portfolio? Uh, uh, so it's uh, going to be like fusion. 50 years. We're still waiting for this. No, it won't be 50 <laughs> years. Um, but no, but what, what Liebert talks about is the smart use of hydrogen, because it is a scarce resource certainly for now, um, and we want green hydrogen. We want hydrogen derived from electrolysis or and, and uh, renewable hydrogen, if that makes sense, uh, not blue hydrogen, where it's, you know, it comes about from natural gas and carbon capture and storage and so on. That's Ireland government policy. Green hydrogen is good. 
Um, but the uses of it, and it's a bit like your your BEO rating in your home. You've got A to G, and you know, well down the 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 list of priorities will be domestic use, for example. It just wouldn't make sense. But there are areas. Typically, we don't have a lot of them, by the way, in Ireland. Like very complex petrochemical processes, um, really high heat industries, northern Germany industry, steel mm -hmm. industries. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of that in Ireland. Um, but they would be the entities that would benefit from scale hydrogen the quicker. Um, but in terms of the pecking order and electrification, you know, we certainly should strive to get electrification everywhere we possibly can because it is cleaner. But we've got to absolutely look at the sources of that. There is no point in us, you know, prolonging a coal-fired power station, which we're not, um, to derive electricity and then saying, isn't it great that we're electrifying everything? It's got to be coming from wind, solar, and then ultimately from green hydrogen. So, Michael. Um, so I'm just kind of conscious that we've got about five minutes left. Um, I like asking this question, but because it's kind of fanciful thinking, but if you were to come back in 10 years time to us, you can all think about this. What, what do you think we will have done? And or like, what will be the things that we'll have achieved that you'll say, oh, that was a good move. That was a good move. That was a good move. Um, I hope you know, he'd be here sooner than in 10 years, first of all. Um, <laughs> well, look, I'll, I'll six years. By yeah, 2030, right. where will we right. be at? Um, at 5.7, maybe more, hopefully more. Um, it's it's going to be interesting to see the next few years whether, you know, uh, whether there'll be specific uh, um, support schemes and specific initiatives from, from politicians to, to, to drive the effort uh, for developing biomethane. Um, how would you, Teresa, what do you think? Oh, wouldn't it be great if our green molecule industry, so green gas, green hydrogen, was as big as, if not bigger, than our wind energy industry today? That that would be my hope. And it's possible, right? We know how to do it. So that would be my ambition and hope. Great. JJ, what do you think? Yeah, I know it's been mentioned that there are plants with plan of mission and ready to, 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 to go, but there is a you know a lead in time to build these plants and six, you know, 2030 uh, uh, is going to come around very soon. So I think if we do achieve the 5.7 terawatt hour target, it would be a great, it would be a great achievement. And then move forward in the next decade. Yeah, yeah. Viva. Yeah, likewise, I think, you know, hitting that 5.7 terawatt hour target by 2030 is key, but that's only the start of the ambition, you know, that the, there's huge scope beyond that. And I think, as Teresa said, hopefully in six years time and 10 years time, We'll have you know a thriving economy all focused on the biomethane with jobs, you know, stimulating the, the economy in, in rural Ireland, um, providing new revenue streams for agricultural use. So yeah, huge, huge potential. And hopefully in six years' time, what will be 25, 30 years in the sector at that point, hopefully we'll have really <laughs> hopefully we'll, you know, we'll be able to look back with pride on the journey Ireland has taken from the from from wind into solar and onwards into green gas. How about you, David? Yeah, look, I won't I won't repeat what everyone said about the 5.7. It's 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 very doable. We're gonna do it. Um the the one that I'm probably keenest on, if I look at six years ahead, is that Ireland is still seen as the destination of choice for large investment in tech, in pharmaceuticals, in the big FDI investors that are coming here. Uh, there was a recent announcement that IBM made about a, a quantum data center in Germany. Uh, and they didn't even consider Ireland for it. And they, they said that publicly. And that's not good enough. Is that because of our energy? They did. It was a number of reasons, okay. but energy security was a key one. And, um, you know, I, I, I think we have done a remarkably amazing job around FDI. And I'd like for that to continue. So by 2030, I'd like for people, if there's any doubts out there, I'd like for them to remember that this economy is, is still built on the best foundations of our educated workforce, our tax system, our security system, our energy security as well. So that's my sense. That that's looking elsewhere in. And in ten years' time, we won't be having discussions about it because it'll be an established indigenous industry sure. that's surviving and thriving and hopefully um, decarbonizing at the same time. Does anyone have any other questions from the floor just before? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm ready with well, gas. We uh, supply um, uh, renewable gas currently to provide energy uses. So we're looking at the interim target of one terawatt hour by next year, as well as five point seven. And you look at to develop a plant, you need feedstock, grid connection, planning connection, and you need your offtake. Preferably, if we're talking wind, 10 or 15 years of a fixed price to get built. So should we not call out the government strategy for able to provide that currently and 
probably the crucial ingredient we need in order to get that built in Ireland. So do you think government is failing to kind of give us the security that we need in order to do what we actually are setting out to do? They need to do it quicker. It's not that about it. Uh, we, we, we've, we've been discussing this too long. And I think everybody agrees. One thing I will say, um, and, and, and I've been quoted, and I'll say it, I'll say it as, as gently as I possibly can, if there was one, one positive, and it's, it's a very small positive, one positive that's come out of the Russia-Ukraine situation is a much better understanding of the energy system and indeed, we've all become, as a, as a continent, less dependent on Russian gas. Um, and the flows, in fact, we haven't talked about it today, but Denmark's a massive exporter now of gas into Germany and into Sweden, uh, from recollection. But what came out of that, that repower EU, thinking that 10% of gas demand being biomethane by 2030, that's across the entire continent. Uh, our government, because of our connection to a third country in the UK, managed to get a, a form of derogation. Um, and, but the 5.7 terawatts still represents 10%. And that's still the target. I, I personally feel that we need to stop discussing it and get on and deliver it. And I do think that's coming. That's my sense is there's more urgency now than there was six months ago. Well, let's draw this discussion to a close then if we we'll stop talking about it and just get on with it. Um, thank you so much for all your insights. A big warm round of applause, please, for all our... <laughs> I think, um, you know, I like the Nelson Mandela quote, when something seems daunting, it always seems impossible until it's done. And I kind of feel like in a couple of years time, we might be looking back on discussions like this and going, oh, yeah, we did it. We got there in the end, uh, despite despite um, delays and dilly dallying. Um, so um, thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you for your attention and your engagement for those in line. And um, thank you for tuning in. And um, for those in the room, you're allowed to um, come downstairs for a reception. For those at home, you'll have to just go make yourself a cup of tea. Um, but I hope that I hope we won't be having this discussion again. I hope we'll just be cracking on with it. Um, so I'll just stop before. Thank you.